Hello. Um, first of all, please forgive my slightly swollen face and my uh, bizarre mouth shapes. I had some dental surgery done on Monday and I am still recovering. But I have this copy of The Woman's Home Companion from 1903, October 1903. It does have a very interesting article about the care of the hair. And I am going to read this article out loud and react to it and kind of give my opinions on it. This is not the only hair care uh, thing from this kind of era that I have. I also have a book from uh, 1910 that has, and this is, the, that book is actually like 50 pages long so I wouldn't be able to read the whole thing, but if people like this video then I might also um, talk a little bit about the other book, but let's just start with this. This is The Care of the Hair by Dr. Casarato. The first of an important series of articles on the hygiene of beauty. It starts, the hair is not only a beautiful ornament, but it is also a sign of strength and health. It is a natural covering which protects the skull from shots, an insulator against the heat of the sun and against the dampness of colds. So the first actual hair care part is uh, a lesson on how to brush the hair. So let's see what he has to say, the way to brush it. And it's got a little picture here illustrating the proper way of brushing the hair. Um, the way to brush it. More than the face and the body, the hair unfortunately suffers from the ravages of time. It dries out and dies. To this physical weakness is added the exhaustion resulting from the different dressings which hideous fashion imposes to the detriment of its vitality. <laughs> this is 1903 when uh, <laughs> huge outrageous pompadours were in style. So yes, uh, the hair fashion at this time was certainly to the detriment of the health of your hair. <laughs> which a uh, hideous fashion imposes to the detriment and vitality, such as the use of curling irons, curling pins, glossing, I don't know what glossing is, and waving the hair, discolorings, hair dyes, heavy headdress, stifling hats, and the immoderate use of lotions, pomatums, etc. There are, however, rules for the hygiene of the hair and the care of the hair rules that every woman ought to know, that she may be able to apply them to herself and thus preserve her hair as long as possible. In order to give your to your hair the hygienic care which it demands, it is necessary first, ladies, that you should know. First, the scalp dislikes dampness. This is something that comes up a lot in these um, Edwardian hairdressing guides. You should get your hair wet as little as possible. Um, the scalp dislikes dampness, which soaks it and is hurtful to its vitality. Second, that the scalp requires constant airing to assist in the evaporation of perspiration and other secretions. People always talk about how they dislike the word moist, but for me the word secretions is much, much more... Ugh. I, I dislike the word secretions much more than I dislike the word moist. Um, and other secretions of the skin which have as injurious an effect upon, its, upon it as dampness. Third, that both the scalp and the hair dislike violent twisting and pulling, which pull their strength and, sol uh, and solidity to a hard test. These three fundamental principles being known, they should be remembered and applied in the best way and as frequently as possible. So none of that was technically about how to brush your hair, but there is some good advice. Um, 
someone that he actually no there really wasn't that he hasn't really said anything other than don't get your hair wet and keep your scalp well ventilated um he's kind of talked about different methods of dressing the hair and different kind of hat styles and stuff which could be detrimental to the health of your hair but it he hasn't really said anything he hasn't really given any actual advice yet so let's keep on reading and see what he says the toilet of the hair the cleanliness of the head is an essential condition for the normal functioning of the scalp but as dampness is hurtful wash your hair only once a month if it is naturally dry and twice if it is oily by nature. And people tell me that I'm gross for only washing my hair once a week. Once a month? <sighs> I, I cannot condone that. Um, twice a month, I mean... Perhaps... Uh, I... I... Um... Okay, that is certainly advice. Uh, to wash it, always use warm water, to which add one spoonful of liquid ammonia, and use either pure white soap or a little of the following liquid soap. And this is the recipe. White soap, 65 grams. Alcohol, 60%. 75 grams. Eau de cologne, 100 grams. Tar soap so much in use in the United States is also good when it is fresh and little charged with tar. All right, tar soap is also apparently very good for, uh, for dandruff. Um, after soaping, rinse the hair well, always with warm water, to which you may add either one teaspoonful of Listerine to 1,000 cubic centimeters of water, or a very light deconcoction of soap wood. Be careful to rinse the hair thoroughly so that no soap remains upon it. Dry your hair first with warm towels, then by letting it hang down your back and placing yourself in proximity to a steam radiator or hearth. All right. So they're very, they're very, um, adamant that your hair should be dried before you do anything with it. When the hair, when washed, loses for some days its suppleness and is more apt to break. In order to remedy this, then, and to give it back its luster, you only require to anoint it slightly at night before retiring with some of the following brillantine. Petrovaseline, 25 grams, eau de cologne, 25 grams, nitrate of porcupine? The word is actually uh, pillowcaprine, but I misread it as porcupine. I think nitrate of porcupine sounds absolutely, I was going to say absolutely delightful, but now that I think about it, that sounds absolutely, absolutely horrifying. Nitrate of pillowcaprine, one gram. Some people who have dry hair contract the habit of wetting it every day, either with warm water or with an alcoholic lotion in order to dress it better and give it harmonious direction. I cannot sufficiently condemn this habit, which is hurtful from all standpoints. Not only does it produce neuralgia, but it rots the hair, predisposes it to fall out and induces baldness. Okay, so don't wet your hair while you're styling it. It will produce neuralgia, rot the hair, and predispose it to fall out. In lieu of water and alcohol, I advise the use of the brillantine for which I have just given the recipe, and which will maintain the hair in normal coolness and softness. If, for some reason, outside, however, of a disease of the scalp, your hair is growing weak, in order to strengthen it and make it return to its original state, you will only have to rub it lightly twice a day with some of the following lotion. Tincture of cinchona, 30 grams. One old rum. Old rum? 
Is that a certain type of rum or is it just rum that's been lying around for a while? Um, old rum, 120 grams. Acetate of ammonia, 20 grams. Ah, the doctor who wrote this was Sarah Bernhardt's beauty specialist for 10 years. Sarah Bernhardt was a very famous actress in the kind of 1890 to 1920. Uh, I'll put a picture of her up here. She famously played Elizabeth I in a silent film, and it is from Sarah Bernhardt's portrayal of Elizabeth I that the myth of Elizabeth I having a limp got started. Elizabeth I did not, in fact, have a limp. Sarah Bernhardt had a limp. Um, but the uh, idea of Elizabeth I having a limp took off from that tangent. Um, is it necessary to cut the hair in order to give it vigor and strength? This is something that we still hear a lot about today. Um, unless when suffering from a pernicious fever or some serious disease of the scalp, it is not at all necessary to cut the hair. One may, every three months, singe the ends from one half inch to one inch only, but no more. Why singe it instead of cutting it? Maybe he's gonna explain. I said before that the scalp needed plenty of air. This constant airing must be given either by letting your hair hang down, your back as long as possible, or by brushing it and combing it in the morning. Okay, so he's not going to explain it. Um, so that is something that I would really like to figure out. Why does he say to singe it instead of cutting it? In the morning and at night, it must the hair must be combed each lock separately, beginning with the ends and gradually going up to the top. That's written in italics, so you know it's important. In this way, the hairs are less liable to break and the knots can be disentangled as you proceed. The combing of the hair must be done with a large comb with widely separate teeth and not with a fine comb. Always use a shell comb and beware of bone and celluloid combs which burn and cut the hair. Okay, always use a shell, a tortoise shell comb, um, not celluloid even though celluloid is significantly cheaper and significantly less cruel to tortoises. Uh, in the Edwardian era, they used to import tortoises for their to, into England, uh, specifically for their shells and also to make turtle, sh turtle soup. And to keep them from crawling around the hulls of the ships, they would nail their fins to the ship while they were still alive, which is absolutely barbaric. Um, Animal rights were not always very high on the list of priorities for people back then or now. Um, that's not to say that there were no animal rights activists back then, which is, it's, that's certainly not true. I mentioned before that the Audubon Society was uh, founded in this era by birds rights activists. Um, so there certainly were animal rights activists, but uh, there were also people who had very little concern for uh, animal rights. Then as now. I mean, <laughs> the, the um, point that I try to make in a lot of these videos is that people back then were very similar to people now, and it's difficult to, um, you can't really make a generalization and say, oh, they didn't care about animal rights back then. Um, you know, some people did, some people didn't. In the morning and at night, after being combed, the hair must be brushed with a rather hard brush, the bristles of which can penetrate the hair without bending. Abstain from using metal brushes as they irritate the scalp and tear the hair. Brush the hair always, each lock separately, but this time from the top to the bottom in italics. And make the brushing last until it becomes brilliant. To sleep, divide your hair into small plates and braid and let it hang down your back. Never be in a hurry when dressing your hair and never pull or tug it. Avoid a too uniform style of headdress, too strained and too tight, which prevents the air from penetrating to the scalp, as this often provokes falling out of the hair. Okay, so he's saying just like change up your hats every once in a while. Uh, and don't wear anything that's too snugly fitting. Avoid heavy headdresses, the makeup of which necessitates a great quantity of hairpins and combs as well as those coiffures which imprison the hair by tightening it. 
Okay. So we've got a lot of information now about what kinds of um, hats we should wear, how we should brush our hair. There's a, um, these pictures I want to go over. This is how not to, not to comb your hair. You see she's starting with the comb at the top and just kind of wrenching it through. You're supposed to comb it this way, one strand at a time, starting from the bottom. Then you go through and brush it. And then that makes it easy to keep it nice and puffy and you just put it into a nice loose braid at night. Um, so there are some illustrations of what he's talking about. Uh, this article is continued on page 32. I've just got to find page 32. Ah, the care of the hair continued. Discard any style of headdress which requires pulling and violent twisting of the hair. And if you are used to parting your hair, change the place of this part as often as possible so as to avoid laying it bare. This is something which I do not do. I always part my hair right here. So maybe I should switch it up. But the thing is, I can, I can style my hair when, my, when it's parted here. I just can't do it when it's parted over here. Um, give your preference to puffed headdresses and avoid as much as possible false hair and heavy hats. What on earth is a puffed headdress? Every type of woman requires it, requires, if not a different style of headdress, at least a few alterations to the prevailing style of the moment. Therefore, do not follow the fashion severely, but adopt a style of headdress which becomes your face the best. I would expand this and say do not follow the fashion of anything severely and adopt a style of dress which becomes your um, preferences and body to the best. It's certainly what I do and I am most certainly not fashionable. The objects which serve for the toilet of the hair must be kept in a particular state of cleanliness. Combs, large and fine, brushes and hairpins, large and small, should be wiped clean every day with a clean, dry cloth and steeped once a week in a solution of ammonia. That sounds like a lot of effort. I, the only cleaning I do is to remove the excess hair from my, from my brush, and I do that not as often as I should. You know, you never really realize how disgusting your hairbrush is until somebody asks to borrow it, and then you realize how, how absolutely filthy it is. Um, so I do not steep all of my brushes and combs and hairpins in ammonia. So maybe I'll have to start doing that. I probably won't because that sounds like a lot of time and effort that I could be putting towards literally anything else. Um, waving the hair, curling it in hot irons, curling papers, and curl pins. I'm not, I'm not sure what a curl pin is. Is it just like a curler, like a, like a rolled curler, are all extremely hurtful to its vitality and by modifying its normal condition cause it to fall out. Chiefly avoid curling irons, for in whatever way they are heated they always injure the roots of the hair. This is all that the simple hygienic care of the hair demands and this is sufficient to keep it clean and uh, prevent it from falling out. The use of heated curlers is something that we still hear about how that's, we still talk about that now, how the use of heat on your hair is damaging. Um, so they were certainly onto something there. We shall now give our attention briefly to the simplest and commonest diseases that affect the scalp. Dandruff. Dandruff is the general cause of the falling out of your hair. Is that true? I never heard that before, that dandruff causes your hair to fall out, or is even a symptom of your hair falling out. Let me know in the comments if that's true. Therefore, you must try to combat this disagreeable disease on its first appearance, or in time it will damage the most luxuriant head of hair. For dandruff, there are several good treatments, of which three of the best are here given. First treatment. Every morning during four or five days, Soak a wad of absorbent cotton in the following preparation to wet the scalp with it. Moisten the hair as little as possible and let it dry. Then sweeten solution of hydrobichler 100 grams, rose water 50 grams, chloral hydrate 6 grams. 
and I have no idea what Van Sweeten solution of high drug Bichler is. Um, or even if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'm probably not. It's spelled H-Y-D-R-A-R-G-B-I-C-H-L-O-R. Second treatment, in the morning and at night, until the complete disappearance of dandruff, rub the scalp with a toothbrush dipped in the following composition. Distilled water of melilot, or melilo, I'm not sure, M-E-L-I-L-O-T, 100 grams, eau de cologne, 20 grams, carbonate of soda, 10 grams, saponine, 2 grams. I don't know what distilled water of melilot or saponine are. The third treatment, dissolve a lump of carbonate of soda the size of a nut. What kind of nut? Also different kinds of nuts. I mean a pistachio or a walnut. The size of a nut in 500 cubic centimeters of water. And every morning, wash your head with a sponge steeped in this solution. After washing, dry your hair with a warm towel. Then rub the scalp with a handful of the following mixture. Tincture of quinella, saponaria, tincture of japarandi, 30 grams, essence of neroli, 10 drops. Okay, again, I have no idea what those ingredients are. Um, it also doesn't say where on earth you're supposed to get these. Maybe you could get them from the pharmacist. Maybe, like, maybe they were common enough. I really don't know. Um, and then it has a small section on uh, oily and dry hair. And then the article concludes. If your hair is oily or fully or full of greasy scabs, wa ew, wash it every morning with tar soap. After this, dry it thoroughly and then rub with a small sponge saturated in the following mixture. Distilled tar water, 225 grams, chlorate of potash, seven and one half grams, liquid ammonia, three grams. After spreading it out at night, powder it well with the following powder. This is, this is the first this is the first reference to hair powder that I've really heard about after the um, 1820s. So that's interesting. Um, the recipe for the powder. Um, salicylic acid, four grams, hydrochlorate of again, I misread it as porcupine. Hydrochlorate of pilocaprine. 2 grams, powdered sulfur, 24 grams, borax, 10 grams, starch powder, 20 grams, talcum powder, 140 grams. If, on the other hand, your hair is too dry, brittle, and your scalp scaly, you must first wash your head with a deconcoction of soap wood and then apply some of the following pomatum. Vaseline, 40 grams, landoline, 20 grams, birch oil, 4 grams, borax, 2 grams, and essence of santal, 20 drops. Continue to use this until the scalp regains its normal aspect and any scabs disappear. To conclude, there is the following recipe to stop the hair falling out and to stimulate its growth. Tincture of cantharides, 10 grams. Tincture of rosemary, 20 grams. Tincture of jabarandi, 20 grams. Spirits of Fioranti, F I O R A V A N T I, Fioranti. I hope I've said that correctly. Fifty grams. Spirits of camphor, fifty grams. Rum, one hundred grams. In the morning and each night, rub your scalp thoroughly with a toothbrush dipped in this solution. All right. So that is what Doctor. What was his name? Passerato has to say about how you should uh, care for your hair. They were struggling with a lot of the things that we struggle with now, and it's really interesting to read about how they went about solving these problems back then. I certainly can't condone all of the advice uh, given in this. Um, I think that washing your hair once a month is pretty gross. And oh, directly following this, there's an ad for the this season of fashionable hats. This one. Um, so please 
please let me know if you enjoyed this video, if you'd like me to cover um, the other hairdressing, or not hairdressing, but the other hair care manual that I have. Um, there's also, there are also some other articles in this magazine which I think are interesting. Um, one of them is inventions that ought to be invented, and I've read this one. Some of the some of the predictions are, you know, very realistic and things that actually very much did happen. Um, they also predict gigantic apples and carrots in the future. Um, so, if you enjoyed this type of video, please let me know. Please let me know if you uh, are going to try out any of the advice um, given in this magazine. Um, I hope you have a nice day. I'll see you later. Bye.